please be seated. And you can turn with me to Philippians chapter 4 as we pick up our series here in verse 2. And we are going to be reading to verse 9. And then next week in the morning service, we'll finish out uh, chapter 4. So Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse 2. And I ask that you pay careful attention to God's word. I entreat Yodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's, any, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things, which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these, these things, and the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray and ask him to bless his word. God, our Father, we thank you again that you, uh, in your mercy, you speak to us, God, that you speak to us through your word. And even as we consider tonight a, a rather well-known uh, passage, we ask, God, that you help us to uh, hear it anew, to, uh, God, truly hang upon uh, your word, for it is life uh, for us. God, help us to be submissive to your word. And, God, may, um, may you receive the honor and glory, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I wonder how many of you uh, like to argue. I think some people like arguments more than others. Uh, I think most people try to avoid conflict if they can. I would say the majority of people would characterize themselves as conflict avoiders. Uh, but we have all been in moments where there is no escaping an argument or a fight. Uh, typically with another person, more than, lo- more than not, a loved one. Um, so if you are close with someone, sibling, friend, uh, a spouse for sure, disagreements are inevitable. And even in the church, you have all, I'm sure, experienced disagreements with other members. Um, maybe some severe, maybe just run-of-the-mill type stuff. I don't know of too many people who like to argue. I think I'm one of those insufferable people uh, that actually prefers to argue, meaning I can turn anything into an argument. Uh, I'd say that's a, it's a gift that I have that, uh, that Laura really likes. Um, she loves it when I argue with her about cooking or driving or you know, those really important issues. Uh, but regardless, if you like it or not, disagreements are inevitable. And the Christian life or what we're taught about the Christian life, is not about avoiding conflict, but handling disagreements the right way. So how can we disagree? How can we overcome our disagreements? Or how should you treat someone that you disagree with? I think that's what Paul is doing here in chapter 4. He's giving us ways that we can remain united even when we disagree with one another. Because remember, back to chapter 2, unity, the theme of unity, is a big part of that chapter in this book. Right back in chapter 2, Paul encourages being of the same mind. That's how he puts it. And that is essential for God's people. So, we're supposed to have unity, to be unified. But how do you do that when you disagree? And that's what Paul is addressing here in chapter 4. So in verse 2, these two women, Yodia, Syntyche, they have a disagreement. And what is Paul encouraging them to do? To agree. And I think in this section that we read, he's giving them ways that they can do that. And 
It's important to remember, so the theme of unity is now brought back up in chapter 4, and it's, it's important to remember that the unity that Paul counsels, going back into chapter 2, what's the main, what's the key to being unified? It's humility, right? Paul says to have the same mind as Christ, and what did Christ do? He humbled himself to the point of death on a cross. And that's how we have unity, humility. And those two themes are kind of interwoven throughout our text this evening. Humility that leads to unity. And as we look at this, this theme, unity through humility, I wanted to re remind us that of what humility is. Right, we know we should be humble. We should be humble like Christ is humble. But humility isn't weakness. Humility isn't passive. Sometimes we might think that. Or we might think that humility is thinking bad thoughts about yourself. And I don't think that's the correct way of framing the way the Bible talks about humility. Because humility, as it relates in comparison to what Christ did, humility is action. It's just, it's not action for yourself. It's action for others. Service to others. Right? Christ humbled himself for our sake. And back in chapter 2, in verses 3 and 4, Paul says to be humble. He says to think of others more highly than yourself. And then what does he say right after that? Look to the interests of others. So that's what humility is. It's not just thinking, oh, I'm not a very good person. Humility is putting other people's needs above your own. And we have to have humility if we want unity. Because, as we said, we will disagree. That is a fact just like these two women in verse 2. And to remain unified, we need to practice humility. And that's what Paul counsels here. That is what he is giving us. Ways to practice humility that brings unity and peace. Right? Verse 7, the peace of God will guard our hearts at the end of verse, and verse 9. The peace of God will be with us. So, unity through humility that brings peace. That's what Paul's giving us. And as you said, we'll start in verse 2. These two women have some kind of disagreement. And the only thing we know about this disagreement is that it's a public disagreement. Right? It's reached Paul all the way in prison. So it must have been a bit, pretty big deal. right? There's no cell phones. There's no emails. There's no quick, hey, Paul, guess what was going on over here? Paul heard about it and had to address it in a letter all the way in prison. And in verse 2, it seems that these women have some bit of prominence into verse 3, or leadership, right? Paul says that they have labored with him in the gospel. So you might think, we could think that they're possibly well-known. People in the church know of these two women, and they have this disagreement. And so you can imagine what happens in a church like that, when you have two prominent figures, or two people that people love and listen to, is that some kinds of factions begin to form. Right? That kind of thing happens all the time in churches, where there's a disagreement and people start taking sides. And sides pile up. Now again, we don't know exactly what the disagreement was, but it's significant enough that Paul had to deal with it publicly in this letter that would have been read aloud to the entire church. And what is he doing with this disagreement? He's counseling for unity. Paul urges them to agree. Now, the question is, on what basis do they agree? Notice how Paul doesn't say anything about the issue. He doesn't say anything about the disagreement. He doesn't weigh in on the argument. He doesn't provide judgment, which being an apostle, pretty sure he could have done if he wanted to. He simply says, agree, in the Lord. That is how they will remain of one mind. Not agreeing on the issue, but agreeing in the Lord. And then in verse 3, Paul goes on to urge this companion, we don't know who that is, to help these women because they have been working with Paul. And he mentions Clement. And then he adds, whose names are written in the book of life. Agree in the Lord with these people. And just a reminder, their names, your names, are written in the book of life. Now, what's the point of that? Well, I think verses 2 and 3 give us a key in how to handle disagreements. Right? He didn't say, agree on the issue. He said, agree in the Lord. And the reason we do that, 
is because our security is in the life that Christ provides. Our names are written in the book of life. So our security is not in the argument. It's not in getting what we want, no matter how important we think the argument, the issue at hand is. Our security is in Christ. Our names are written in the book of life, which allows us to agree in the Lord. So we don't love others, we don't serve others because they agree with us or when we have convinced them that they are wrong and we are right. We love and serve on the basis of what Christ has given to us. We love and serve because our names and their names are written in the book of life. So our assurance of being in Christ, that enables you to look the other way or to drop the matter before an argument breaks out or to admit that you might be wrong, that you might need to trust this other person's judgment. And the reason you can do that is because your security isn't in that issue. It's not in the argument. It's not in being right. Your security is in the life that Christ provides. Because in an argument, in a fight, what do we want most of the time? What are we looking for? We could say a lot of things. I think in a lot of ways, fundamentally, in most arguments, disagreements, we're looking for vindication. In a disagreement, we want to prove that either I did nothing wrong or that you did something wrong. And in the heat of that argument, it can be very easy for us to find our identity, at least in some way, at least in that moment, we find our identity tied to that argument. Right? That's why we can't let it go. And if you can't let an argument, disagreement go, fundamentally, that's because of pride. It's pride that swells up in us when we, needed to, when we need to be vindicated at all costs, all the time. It's pride when we want people to recognize and to submit to what we want or to what we did or to admit their faults and our innocence. And really, I think that is the root of a lot of sin, especially when it comes to our relationships with others, whether that's in your marriage, with your kids, another member in the church. A lot of strife comes from the need to be vindicated. Either I did nothing wrong, and everybody needs to see it, or you are definitely wrong, and you need to admit it. And the key is to humble ourselves in that disagreement. And the key to humbling yourself, to looking the other way, to not needing the last word, is to find in that moment, not just some theological abstraction, in that moment is to find your security in the life that Christ provides. It's like what Paul says in Colossians. If your life is bound up in Christ, then that's what you care about. That's what you think about. Not about winning arguments or being right. And remembering that, remembering that you and the person you disagree with, that their names, your names, are written in the book of life, helps you to agree in the Lord. It's the Lord you agree on. Everything else, not so much. If you agree in the Lord, if your life is bound up in him, then you can deal with the disagreements that you have. And I think that's what Paul's talking about throughout the rest of this passage in verses 4 through 9. I think each verse is a continued discussion on humility and unity. How to love and serve those we disagree with. How can we serve in the Lord? Because in verse 4, Paul says, rejoice. Where did that come from? Why are we rejoicing at this moment, at this disagreement? Maybe these two women are thinking just that. Re rejoice? How is that going to help? Do you know what she said about me? And I'm expected to rejoice? Well, it's very hard to be proud and bitter when you rejoice, right? It's very hard to nurse a grudge when you're rejoicing 
and giving thanks all of the time. It's like trying to whistle when you're in a bad mood. Just don't do that. And Paul's saying, you want to agree in the Lord, you want the humility to be able to do that, then rejoice always. Never stop rejoicing. And the reason that brings humility is that it takes the focus off of you and it puts it on God. It takes the focus off of the person that's annoying you so badly and it rejoices in the mercy and the love of God. So when you rejoice, you stop thinking of self and of your problems and of your offenses and your hurts and you are now thinking of the steadfast love of the Lord. Because a key to rejoicing, right, when we say rejoice, a key to that is remembering. When we rejoice, we are remembering all that God has done for us. And we need to do that. We need to remember, especially when things aren't going well. When life is hard, when there's conflict, when there's tension, that's the best time to remember and rejoice. And that's what happens in the book of Lamentations. Right? The book of Lamentations is a great what? It's a great lament. Right? Things are going terribly. And the author lets God know that. And in chapter 3, all of that sorrow, it turns in verse 20. All of the sorrow turns to joy or comfort when the author does what? When he remembers. In verse 20 he says, But in the midst of all this misery, I call this to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. When he calls to mind, in the midst of lamentation, when he remembers, he has hope. Remembering is rejoicing. Or like the psalmist says in Psalm 77, when he's crying out to God in his hour of trouble, then he says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. And that's how we have joy, even in sorrow. Because that's what rejoicing is. Remembering the steadfast love of the Lord. So when there is conflict, when there is disagreement, when someone is being obnoxious and odious, and you want them to know it, remember. Remember not what they've done, Remember what the Lord has done. Remember his steadfast love. Ponder, meditate on his mighty deeds. And that will lead to rejoicing always. And that's how you can deal with difficult people. Because that's what Paul is saying in verse 5. When he says, let your reasonableness, gentleness be known to all. I think here Paul is talking about our ability to put up with difficult people. Because when this word reasonableness, the Greek word, when it gets brought up in the New Testament, like in 1 Timothy 3, or in James 3, or in Titus 3, it has the context of peaceable. Meaning, someone who makes peace in the midst of difficulty and trouble. Because right? we all know those kinds of people, we are, we are those kinds of people sometimes, maybe a lot of times, who stir the trouble up. Right? There's trouble, and we make it worse shouldn't do that. And in verse 5, Paul, said, Paul says Christians should be known for their ability to not do that or to bring peace. People should look at how the church handles problems, how we handle disagreements, arguments, and they should notice that something is different among those people. It isn't that there is no conflict in Christian circles. It's just that when there is, there's also a kindness or a humility in disagreements that you don't find anywhere else. And it kind of reminds me of what Paul gets on to the Corinthians about in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Right, the main issue there is that everyone is taking each other to court. Right? And Paul says, believers taking other believers to be judged by non-believers, that's a bad thing. It's a terrible thing. Clearly, they are handling their disputes 
poorly. He says they should rather be defrauded by one another than to handle disagreements that way. Almost, it's almost like the handling of the disagreement is just as important as the outcome of the disagreement. And those who follow Christ don't handle disagreements like that. This should be the opposite. The world should notice the gentleness, the humility that we have, the willingness to drop the matter, or to take responsibility for some of the fault. That is how we treat those with whom we disagree. And Paul gives us the motivation to do that in verse 5. He gives us how we can do that. He says, let your reasonableness be known. The Lord is at hand. Now, what does that mean? Well, that's not a reference to Jesus' return, like when he comes again. Uh, Paul doesn't think that Christ was about to show up or that we never know when Christ is going to come, so we better be nice to one another. When Paul says that, the Lord is at hand, that is in reference to the imminence of God meaning God is near, he's close to us, he hears us, he acts on behalf of us. Like that's what Paul means. And because of that, because the Lord is at hand, we can put up with obnoxious people. We can be gentle and reasonable with mean, unreasonable people. We can stop being the obnoxious people because We have God with us, Christ. And because of that, we can bear whatever we need to bear. That's a a key ingredient of love. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. What does love do? It's patient, and it bears all things. It doesn't get its way in all things. It bears all things. And we can do that because Christ is near to us. And that's what he explains in verse 6. Since the Lord is at hand, we can be reasonable and gentle in our disputes with others. And we know he is at hand because we can make known to him all of our prayers, all of our supplications, all of our thanksgivings. Right? We can come to him because he's close. He hears us. He wants us to come to him with our problems and our rejoicings. And Paul says the result of that is peace. Verse 7. A peace that will guard your hearts and our minds. So instead of choosing to fight and win, to take each other to court, we bear with those we disagree with. And we do that because God is near. And because we can take those anxieties to him and he hears us. Again, it's taking the focus off of you and putting it on God. You can deal with difficult people with difficult disagreements, because we have God. You can deal with your anxieties because God is at hand, ready to help you. Put your trust and focus on him, not on yourself, not on the other person that you disagree with, and then you'll have peace. Because anxiety is the opposite of peace. Anxiety breeds strife. It breeds tension between people. And The thing about anxiety is, we hear talk a lot about anxiety these days, and the thing about being anxious is the gospel isn't, don't be anxious. That's ridiculous, because there are thousands of things to be anxious about. Paul knows that. The gospel isn't, don't be anxious. The gospel is, here is how you can deal with your anxiety. The gospel is the cure for anxiety. Because how could anxiety hurt the church? We might think of it as just a personal thing that we have. How does anxiety hurt your relationships? Well, fundamentally, anxiety makes you self-centered. It makes you insensitive to the needs of others. Because what happens if you're anxious? If you've ever been anxious, which I'm sure you have, when you're anxious, who are you always thinking about? you. You're thinking about all the problems that you have, all the worries that you have, the threats uh, that you can see. Right? That's what anxiety does. It obsesses over some problem that you have. And the more anxiety you have, the more self-centered, 
and insensitive to others you become. And then, when you're anxious, and when there's a dispute, when there's a disagreement, you're not thinking about the other person. You're only thinking about you, about being right or about being vindicated. The worst time to argue is when you're anxious. Anxiety breeds strife. But when you take the focus off of yourself, verse 6, when you bring your prayers, your supplications to God, and you give him thanks, that takes the focus off of yourself. Then you have peace. Then you can look to the needs of others. You don't need to obsess about what's happened to you that you don't like or that's unfair. Peace comes from relying on God. Not on your problems, not worrying about what they are. And that peace will guard your heart and your mind from the selfishness that creates problems. So anxiety makes you self-centered. And peace, reliance on God, gives you the ability to look to other people's needs first. And I think that's what Paul's talking about in verse 8. Right, verse 8, this famous verse about thinking about excellent and beautiful things. I think that's talking about people. I don't think he's talking about that you should think about classical music or great literature or any other abstraction that we might find excellent or beautiful. I don't think this is a general find good things to think about and think about them. Now, we should do that. Christians should be obsessed with beauty and purity and excellence. But in this context, I think Paul's talking about people, meaning the peace of God will lead you to find the good in other people and then to focus on what is good in that person. I think this has the context of disagreement, strife. Because, as I'm sure you are aware, maybe we're not as aware of this as we should be, we're all obnoxious. Right? We, are all, we all have things about us that are annoying and sinful, things that can threaten your relationships. And there are certain tests as you go through life that reveal just how obnoxious and sinful you are. Because when you're young, you're, you're pretty good. I mean, you don't, you don't necessarily think of all your flaws, or maybe you do. Um, but as you get older, the Lord will reveal that more and more. And a really good way to find out how bad of a person is, or how bad of a person you are, is to get married, right? Because that's one thing that happens once the honeymoon stage ends, however long that might be, is that your spouse will inevitably uncover all of the annoying and all of the sinful habits that you have. And at times, that will be all that you can see in the other person, is what they do that just drives you crazy. And to get along with that, to love and serve someone that is genuinely annoying and sinful, you can't just dwell on all the things that they do wrong. Right? It doesn't mean you ignore it, necessarily. But to love another, you have to think about the goodness in them. I think that's what 1 Peter 4 means when he says that love covers a multitude of sins. It's not saying that it enables sins. It overlooks them. It chooses to dwell on the good, the excellent, the beautiful, even if it's super, super tiny. And that's Paul's exhortation here in verse 8. That's what the peace of God enables us to do. Because as loath as we might be to admit it, everybody has some noble quality. Right? Even your spouse in that moment when you hate them so much, they have something noble, something right about what they're saying. I think we'd all admit, very few people are as bad as they could possibly be. And if there's anything excellent in the person, not your favorite person, the person with whom you have the disagreement, then you need to find those things and you need to dwell on them. That's how you transform your attitude towards someone. Thinking well of them. Finding out what they do well. And that's not necessarily something that's taught nowadays. Something that is in direct opposition to what you would find in the mass media, for example. 
Right? What is the media obsessed with? Finding the worst in people, right? That's why so many of the stories deal with tragedy and violence and mistakes. Right? It sells, for sure, but it's the worst part of humanity that they focus on. And that might have its uses, I don't know. But for Christians, especially when it comes to our fellow believers, people who have their names in the book of life, we choose to dwell on the good. We choose to focus on the beautiful and the excellent in others. And that's how we can forgive others. And it takes humility to do that, to lower yourself and to find the good things about someone else. And obviously, if you've ever tried that or if you think about that, that's very hard to do. Right? In fact, when you are in a disagreement with someone, the last thing you want to do is point out some noble quality that they have or how good their argument is. Right? That's not easy. We might not want to do that. But Paul says that a reliance on God will bring peace that guards your heart and mind, meaning it enables you to do that. In fact, Paul takes it one step further in verse 9, and he says, don't just dwell on these things, but imitate them. In verse 9, he says, what you have seen in me, these good, excellent things, practice that. So not only are we to, are we to be finding, thinking about finding the good in others, but we should also be imitating them. Don't just think about it. Be like that person. And remember, the key to unity is humility. And to imitate someone, what do you have to do? You have to admit your need. You have to admit your need to be like them or recognize that you don't have something that you need to have. Imitation, it takes humility. Because a proud person doesn't imitate anybody, or at least he doesn't confess that he imitates anybody, because he's self-sufficient. He doesn't need what anyone else has. But a humble person sees the good in others and then recognizes his or her need to be like them. He imitates the good qualities even in the obnoxious people. And Paul says to practice these things. And that's what I want to end on here in verse 9 in context of unity and humility, peace with others, is that what Paul says in verse 9, is that that takes practice. Right? Sometimes we might think of the Christian life, you get become saved, and we just get holier and holier, or I don't know, we just are more sanctified by being a Christian. But it's important to realize that to have peace, to have unity, that takes work. Right? Just like going to the gym to get physically fit, you have to work at humility. You have to work for peace. We have to continually bring our prayers and our anxieties to God. We might not feel like doing it, but that's what will work. That's what will produce humility, unity. We have to work at thinking well of others. Right? That doesn't just happen. We have to work at finding the good in those we disagree with. And that is how the peace of God will be with us. So pursue, practice, Peace in your relationships. Not being right, not winning, but pursue peace. Right? That doesn't mean compromising truth. Paul says multiple times to stand firm. But in our pursuit of truth, we pursue peace with one another. And why? Well, what did Christ do for you? What do you have now with God? Romans 5 since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Christ. That's why you pursue peace. It's because he created that peace for you. So then we go out and we practice and pursue that peace as well. And may God grant us the strength and the humility to do it. Let's pray. Our God in heaven, we thank you that you have uh, given us uh, your son, God, that you have given us the means that we might know you, that we might, uh, God, have the motivation uh, to think lowly of ourselves, to think of others more highly. And God, in, in pursuing that peace, we ask uh, that you grant us your, your spirit, uh, because there are many times in our days and our weeks where 
Uh, the flesh is weak, and we do not desire that. And God, we ask that you help us to, uh, to practice these things, to bring our, our prayers, our supplications to you. And God, in that, that you would grant us the peace uh, that comes only from your goodness and your graciousness. God, we thank you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.